On this vote, the yeas are 255 and the nays are 172. The bill is passed. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado seek recognition? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk to change the long title and make it more accurate. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Polis of Colorado. Amend the title so as to read, a bill to increase pollution, endanger the public health, and not address taxes in any way. The question is on the amendment. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. The noes have it. The amendment is not adopted. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina rise? Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns to meet at 10 a.m. tomorrow for morning hour debate and noon for legislative business. Without objection. The chair will now entertain requests for one-minute speeches. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Florida seek recognition? The gentleman is correct. The House is not in order. The gentlewoman from Florida. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. April is Autism Awareness Month. Autism is a disorder that impairs an individual's social interactions and communication skills with others. Sadly, autism is one of the fastest growing developmental disorders in our nation. It is estimated that a child is diagnosed with autism every 15 minutes. While some autistic children will grow up to function in society, Others will need some level of professional care for life. Groups such as the Autism Society of Miami-Dade in my congressional district are committed to providing support and opportunities to enhance the lives of individuals within the autism spectrum as well as their families and caregivers. I urge all Americans to become involved in supporting families with children and adults with autism. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlewoman yields back. Does, it, does the gentleman from Oregon seek recognition? Does any member seek recognition? For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Request permission to address the House for one minute. Without objection. Today we are engaged in a debate about out of control government spending. But there should never be an issue about fully funding our military. They should never worry that Congress will not provide them the resources to defend this nation. So this House just passed a CR that fully funds the military and also cuts $12 billion. But the White House has issued a veto threat with no explanation. Why? Does the Commander-in-Chief intend to command a military with no money? Doesn't he know we are engaged in three wars? I just received an email from one of our troops. He says, how would the citizens of America feel if the military did not defend the nation because we went on strike? But we won't go on strike. We will live in tents, eat MREs, and hope our family can survive without pay, food, and shelter. The House has voted to support the military. The Senate needs to pass this bill. The President needs to sign up to support our troops. Are you in, Mr. President? And that's just the way it is. The gentleman yields back. 
For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Without objection. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize the Texas A&M University women's basketball team on their remarkable run in the 2011 NCAA tournament and their victory over Notre Dame to claim their first ever national championship in school history. I have the privilege to represent both Baylor University and Texas A&M. I don't think that there are many members here in this house that have the opportunity to represent two schools that advance to the Elite Eight in the NCAA Women's Tournament. However, I do, and one of them went all the way and won a national championship. Also, as a member of the Texas Aggie class of 1976, I'm especially thrilled that the final score was 76 to 70. Coaches Gary Blair and Vic Schaefer and their staff should be commended for their leadership in guiding the Texas Aggies to their sixth straight NCAA tournament and their first ever national title. And let me add that Danielle Adams, the Aggies All-American senior, scored 30 points, the second highest total in championship game history. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to stand before my colleagues and to say that there is no other coach, no other team, nor any other fan base that deserves this more than Coach Blair, Coach Blair, the Texas Aggie women's basketball team, and the loyal fans at Texas A&M University. Good gig of Aggies and great job. Gentleman yields back. The House will be in order, please. For what reason does the gentleman from Colorado rise? The gentleman from Louisiana, what purpose does the gentleman rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, with respect to the possible shutdown, I have to say that this is directly as a result of a distinct lack of leadership. Former Speaker Pelosi showed no leadership in not even attempting to submit a 2011 budget in the 111th Congress. Senator Reid has been totally unwilling to submit an alternative 2011 budget, and the President, until this week, has totally checked out of the process. This country desperately needs leadership. Speaker Boehner has been providing that leadership as he has been fully engaged and has submitted a number of excellent 2011 budget proposals. But he can't do it by himself. Mr. President and Senator Reid, it is not too late to step up and provide the kind of leadership this country wants and desperately needs. Do the right thing now. Agree to this legislation that will help get this country back on sound fiscal footing. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what reason does the gentleman from Colorado rise? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, this House took the unprecedented step of doing the right thing. We stood up for our men and women in our armed forces. However, Senator Reid and the President have already announced before the vote was even taken that it was going to be dead on arrival. Senator Reid said that it's a fantasy. Well, Senator Reid, let me give you a reality. The reality is our men and women in our armed services who are risking their lives for us deserve better than the politics of usual. Senator Reid, we call on you and we call on the President of the United States to stand with us who are standing for the American people, our men and women in the armed forces, our parents, grandparents, and our future generations as well. We have to not only protect our present, but build for our future, have actual fiscal responsibility in this country. You can no longer allow to be the party of no no ideas, no solutions, simply saying no because you're bankrupt of ideas. Now's the time for action. The American people are counting on us. I yield back, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman yields back. Are there requests? The chair lays before the House the following personal request. Leave of absence requested for Mr. Freelinghuysen of New Jersey for today and the balance of the week. Without objection, the request is granted. Without objection, the request is granted. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5th, 2011, the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee minority leader.
Thank you. I want to turn our attention to the issues that are before us today and see if we can have a better understanding of what has taken place. We just heard a little bit about uh, honoring our troops. Let's be very clear about this. The Democratic caucus in this House, the President, and the Senate will always and have always honored our troops. We're in the midst of a very serious budget crisis for this year with very, very serious issues at stake. And the Republicans chose to attach to the funding bill very numerous cuts that devastate important programs that affect the well-being of every man, woman, and child in this nation and indeed around the world. Because of those cuts, as well as certain language that was added to the bill, we chose not to vote for the funding, and the President has said, stop the games, stop playing around, give us a straight funding, up and down, on funding the government without all of these add-ons and games that are being played by our Republican colleagues. The President has asked for a clean bill. We should give him a clean bill and carry on to fund the government and provide for our troops and our military families. And we will do that. Now, let's understand what is at stake, not only in the current year's budget, the next seven months, but in the year beginning October the 12th. The Republicans have put together a proposal that would devastate seniors and those who are unable to care for themselves and provide themselves with medical services, in other words, depending upon the Medicaid program. Very straightforward. The proposal that was put out by the Republican caucus two days ago would terminate and stop Medicare as we know it today. Medicare is a program in which every working American pays into it, and when they become 65, they expect to receive the Medicare health care benefits that are guaranteed, or at least have been guaranteed, for the last 40-some years. That's a uniform benefit package across this nation. It is a very successful program. It's one that Americans literally live long enough to get into. And yet the Republican caucus is proposing to terminate it, to end the Medicare program, and instead turn over the $400 billion a year that goes into the Medicare services, turn it over to the private health insurance companies, the biggest gift ever given to the private ins health insurance companies. I know those companies. I was the insurance commissioner in California for eight years, and I spent most every day of those eight years chasing after the health insurance companies, forcing them to pay claims, and stopping them from discriminating against people that had pre-existing conditions, and developing programs and policies that were underfunded, underpaid, and underperformed. That cannot happen to our seniors. But that's what the Republicans want to do. And we need to stop it. And we will. Because the seniors of this nation already sense what is at hand. They already know that the Republican budget proposed would devastate one of the two pillars of the social safety net that every senior in this nation at one time or another depends upon. The second pillar we already have seen the path that this is going to go on. In 2004, the Republican caucus, together with the Republican president, George W. Bush, proposed to privatize Social Security. Fortunately, the revolt that started on the Democratic caucus in this House and carried across the nation stopped that from happening. We know what's coming down the train track here, and that is another effort 
to privatize Social Security, to take those hundreds of billions of dollars and turn them over to Wall Street so that Wall Street can play additional financial games. It will not happen. Americans will not give up Social Security and Medicare to satisfy the whims of the Republican caucus that seems determined upon destroying effective government in this nation. I'd like to call upon my colleague from the great state of Oregon, Mr. DeFazio, if you'll join me in this conversation and we'll see where it takes us. Well, I thank the gentleman. Certainly his uh, extraordinary and extensive experience as an insurance commissioner uh, ably qualifies him to comment upon what's going to happen uh, when the Republicans kill Medicare and instead uh, force future seniors into private insurance plans, presumably sold through some sort of exchange. Now, of course, the Republicans just spent the last year reviling Obamacare, which creates exchanges for people who are uninsured. They said people who are uninsured should not be forced to go to exchanges and buy good standard policies. Well, now what they want to do is force future seniors to give up Medicare and force them to go to exchanges and buy private policies with some premium support. Now, there's a, a few problems with this issue. Uh, among the things they repeal are the reforms of the insurance industry. And one of the most critical reforms as far as seniors or older workers or older Americans go or Americans who've ever been ill or ever had an ill kid is removing the condition that an insurance company can have a pre-existing condition exclusion. That is, you were sick once, they won't sell you a policy. Uh, maybe they'll sell you a policy, but they will exclude that condition and other conditions they think you might have, and they're going to charge you four, five, six, ten times as much for your policy because you're a risky person. They only want the gravy. It also repeals another little trick the industry. This has already stopped now. This is one of the most horrific things the insurance industry has done to people in America. Pay your premium every week. Your employer pays your premium every week. You get sick. This happened to a woman in Texas, actually, uh, Joe Barton's district. And uh, she had breast cancer, needed uh, serious treatment. The insurance industry, the insurance company she had, put a team on her case. Isn't that great? They want to help her out. No, they want to find out a way to throw her off the plan. And they found that once she had gone to a dermatologist and didn't tell them about it. And that might have been related to her breast cancer, so they threw her out of the plan. Now, the dermatologist wrote a letter to the insurance company and said, well, no, actually, no, this woman just kind of had a skin condition that has nothing to do with cancer, and, you, you know, you can't do this, and they did. And finally, uh, to give them credit, uh, Joe Barton uh, intervened, called the president of the company and said, you're getting one big black eye here. Uh, give this woman back her health insurance. And she got it back, but uh, quite a bit later, her cancer had advanced, and it, it hurt her chances for a full recovery. That's called rescission. Under the Republican proposal, recessions are back. You get sick, your company's got to comb through your life and find out a way not to pay your policy. And oh, by the way, if you're sick now and your policy lapses at the end of the year, well, they won't have to redo it because they're doing away with that reform too. So we'll take away those horrible reforms that the Democrats put on the uh, anti-competitive insurance industry. And oh, by the way, the insurance industry is exempt from antitrust law. So the insurance industry can and does and has discriminated in these ways. It can and does fix prices, can and does share or divide markets to drive up their profits. All those things are back under the Ryan proposal. Isn't that great? Now, how is this going to serve seniors? Okay, now, here they are. Uh, they're going to get a little premium support. Uh, that is, the federal government will not let them have the money. They don't even get a voucher, so they could just like say, well, I'm going to you know, go do something on my own. They have to buy one of the health care plans that the Republicans would dictate they can buy, presumably through an exchange, and they'll get a little premium support. The government will give the money directly to the insurance company. Now, the insurance company can charge them whatever premium they want. So uh, this is problematic. Now, around here, the, the Republicans are a little schizophrenic. They, some days they love uh, the Congressional Budget Office when it gives them results they like, and other days they hate the Congressional Budget Office 
uh, when it gives them answers they don't like. So in this case, uh, the Congressional Budget Office looked at it and said, well, actually, under the Ryan plan, uh, seniors who today pay 25% of their health care costs in the aggregate, under the Ryan plan in the future, they will pay 68% of their health care costs. Guess what that means? That means we are back to 1964. Now, there's not many people around here old enough to remember 64. I certainly wasn't serving here, but I know what happened then. Congress passed, Lyndon Baines Johnson signed, Medicare. Now, one of the principal drivers of that was we had a poverty rate for seniors, that is, our parents and grandparents were at twice the poverty rate that they are today because of medical costs. Nobody can save enough money to provide for their medical care. And if you can't buy insurance, which most seniors can't and couldn't, uh, and uh, you get sick, you're bankrupt, you lose everything. So, and the principal thing that drove seniors into poverty and bankruptcy in those days was medical costs. So Medicare was established. And now the greatest legacy proposed here by Mr. Ryan, uh, the chair of the Budget Committee, is to end Medicare. And he's doing this under the guise of the path to prosperity. The question would be, whose prosperity? Not the seniors. Perhaps it's the insurance industry. I'd be happy to yield time back to the gentleman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. DeFazio. I want to go back over. I heard you toss out uh, two numbers. One number was the amount of medical, uh, the, the percentage of the cost of medical care that seniors now pay. Did you say 28 percent? It's about 25 percent on average okay. yeah, of all their medical costs. And if the, the ones who are the seniors are eligible for Medicare. Okay. If the uh, Republican proposal goes forward, seniors will wind up paying how much of 68 percent of their health care costs I see so we're shifting the cost to the seniors right right we're not going to do we're anything about at poverty if the gentleman would yield we're of not going to do anything about the cost of medical care or the premiums charged or the egregious practices of the insurance industry we're just going to shift the costs onto future seniors and many of these seniors many of these people if they're 55 today they're paying into social social security and medicare for 35 37 years and now suddenly up oh, sorry can't have it game's over you Please can put that me. rip would, back would up I, if i could just one Please. other point the uh, the other thing since uh, the republicans seem to want to roll back the clock is uh, they're going to bring back the donut hole. Now, the donut hole is this bizarre construct of the Republican prescription drug benefit. Remember, instead of designing a low-cost prescription drug benefit that was uniform and available to all seniors on Medicare, we could have done that at a very, very low cost, uh, the Republicans said, let's subsidize the pharmaceutical and insurance industries and create a confusing mix of plans, and that's what we'll do for seniors. Three quarters of a trillion dollars, $750 billion over 10 years to subsidize the pharmaceutical and insurance industry and give seniors a donut hole. Now, last year, we began to close the donut hole, and this year, the, the pharmaceutical industry has to give discounted prices to seniors in the donut hole. Mr. Ryan would undo that. No more discounted prices for seniors in the donut hole. That's eating into the obscene profits of the pharmaceutical companies. So they got a little provision in this bill. The donut hole is back. Make the world safe for donut holes. That's the uh, Ryan path to prosperity. I don't think so. It seems <laughs> to me to be the path to poverty for seniors. And it goes way, way beyond that. I notice that our colleague from Texas, Sheila Jackson Lee, has joined us. Ms. Lee, if you would care to uh, comment, I know this is an issue you are deeply concerned about. Well, since like uh, Peter, I spent six or seven hours on the floor of the House some years ago, Peter, I guess the 1990s, when we were fighting against uh, the inevitable uh, donut hole. We held a vote open. I shouldn't say we. The Republicans held a vote open uh, for at least uh, six or seven hours. Uh, I think we voted at 5 a.m. when the last arm was twisted. I think someone had a broken arm uh, in order to ensure the donut hole was in. We, of course, have come back Democrats and created the Affordable Care Act. And I tell you, every senior senator that I have gone through since the passage, the famous passage of the Affordable Care Act, seniors have said, thank you. Thank you. If anyone has an 84-year-old mother, I just lost my mother, but our conversation centered around the enormous course of prescription drugs and how relieved 
uh, she was to at that time to have had uh, some relief uh, from the donut hole. Now, as we watched our friends uh, just a few, uh, maybe about an hour or so ago, I hope there was some uh, camera view of the glee that was shown when there was a suggestion that we would shut the government down uh, and in essence implode, if I could use that on the floor of the House, any budgeting com conversation that makes sense, such as the fact that what we're doing now uh, with the CR uh, is dated and old. Uh, it is passe. It is cutting into profiting, not profiting, but funding for a present year. What it's doing tomorrow, which is what the groundwork is being laid, is literally destroying uh, the systems as we know it. Sixty-six percent of the seniors don't like this plan. But I want to throw something out. Let me let them understand what the plan is. The plan is block grants. Block grants given to disparate state governments of which we have no control over to be able to manipulate and play with Medicare. What sense does that make? Block grants that will in fact be able to uh, be used for whatever we want to use. The state of Texas, for example, received $3.2 billion in education funds through the American Reinvestment Recovery Act. Where is it, my good friend? Uh, it is in the rainy day fund, never used for schools. Can you imagine block grants for Medicare? Can you imagine the nursing homes that uh, will be closed and uh, through Medicaid and then, of course, uh, seniors getting Medicare? Uh, and then they shout for joy, not only for shutting down the government over the next two days, but they shout for joy for the kind of budget uh, that they believe they will be able, they whet their appetite, that they will be able to do for 2012. They will implode this country as we know it. We want budget cuts. We don't want to see the government shut down, but there's a morality and a character and an integrity, and there's something called a heart. And I like what you're saying there. The Republican budget would destroy Medicare. And I just want to say this. We've been around this block before. I heard one Republican leadership uh, say some years ago, over my cold, dead body, the opposition to uh, my president, uh, who was a great hero of Texas, Lyndon Baines Johnson, even when he tried Medicare, there were those who said how it would be to destroy America, how it was going to undermine America. And look where we are today. How many lives have we saved because seniors had Medicare? And I see that there is this effort to bury this program that has kept the grandmothers and granddads of America's children alive for them to be able to see their grandchildren grow up because they've had good health care. Where is the morality? Well, we, we seriously question the morality of the proposal that's being put forward by the Republican caucus. Uh, you said something that I want to focus in on. The details are important. We talked about Medicare and the end of Medicare as we know it. And basically, as uh, Mr. DeFazio was saying, it's a program in which Medicare becomes privatized, the money's turned over to the insurance companies, our future, our, our seniors future turned over to the insurance companies and the WIMS. But you also raised a very, very important point. And that is, all across this nation, there are millions of Americans who are in nursing homes who have who now depend upon the Medicaid program, Medicaid program, for the payment to the nursing homes. In the budget program, there is the block granting of the Medicaid program, and therefore the likelihood that the payments to the nursing homes will be reduced or end, and those people will not be able to get care in the nursing home. I'm going to... Uh, Stop for a moment, yield back my time, and uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield, I reserve. reserve my time. The chair will receive a message. Mr. Speaker, a message from the President of the United States. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Secretary. I'm directed by the President of the United States to deliver to the House of Representatives a message in writing. The gentleman from California may proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd love to see what that message is. I think we got some sense of it earlier in the day. 
uh, and it speaks to the issue of, the, I suspect it speaks to the issue of the continuing resolution, and it is the effectuation of the promise he made earlier in the day that should the in legislation that passed here about an hour and a half ago, two hours ago, that is the continuing resolution, should it arrive on his desk, he will veto it. No, I haven't seen it, but I'll bet that's what's in that, that envelope. Be a if you could yield just for a uh, moment, of course, I want to thank please, the gentleman Jackson. for the clarification, uh, but for, for separating out, I want to add something. The, the Medicare um, is a program that is going to be wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, uh, privatized uh, and income-driven uh, without any uh, basis and substance, meaning uh, plainly if you are more wealthier, this has nothing to do with how you would do Medicare today if someone suggested uh, that you uh, staggered uh, uh, the amounts on income. This has to do with if you can even get Medicare, uh, it will be because you have enough money to get Medicare because it will be in that system. And then, of course, there's some little secret backroom corner where they have throw something out about a public system that is not even defined. But you make a very good point about nursing homes, which I have a lot in my district. In fact, we are always hearing from them uh, regarding uh, maintaining uh, their, their status. And certainly we are very keen to make sure that these nursing homes meet their own standards. But they provide refuge and rest, if you will, for not only the seniors, uh, but the frail and the disabled. And I just want to paint this picture for you, Mr. Jamaldi. I just want to paint the picture of no room at the end lights out, uh, doors wide open, and the drumbeat playing as people are being rolled out of nursing homes in wheelchairs, uh, with crutches, some on beds. Maybe we can just imagine the tragic scenes of Hurricane Katrina when nursing home residents were being pouring out of nursing homes in the uh, wake of the disaster of Hurricane Katrina. Well, let me tell you, we've got Hurricane Ryan and there's a disaster coming, uh, and frankly, with all good intentions of our good friends on the other side of the aisle, if we had sat down at the table of compromise and projected how we can best serve America by reducing uh, the uh, deficit, the debt, uh, and, and recognizing that we have morality and we have values that will help this country, uh, and might I just say, we're talking about seniors, but don't forget there are many, many families that take their children the pediatricians on Medicaid, and that's their primary care provider, just like Medicare. So I would simply uh, add uh, this word that I'm not ready to bury Medicare now, are, are and you? I believe there's a, there's, a, there's a rejuvenation, there's a rebirth coming, and that is the American people saying, no, not on my watch. This is a non-starter, and I am glad to be standing here with you today. Well, I, do you think maybe this particular uh, gravestone here doesn't have to happen? I, I believe if we stand, if, gentlemen, you, if we stand committed to educating the American public, it doesn't have to happen. It should not happen. Well, I'm going to take this down because I know that the American public, whether they are seniors now or be seniors in the future, understand the incredible importance of Medicare to the American society. Whether you're young or old, you know that Medicare has always been there since 1964 to provide medical services to those people 65 and over and some who are younger than 65 that have gone through terrible uh, medical circumstances and unable to care for themselves. So we're going to take this tombstone hmm. and we're going to bury it along with Mr. Ryan's proposal to terminate Medicare as we know it. So let's be aware, American public, what is at stake here with the proposal that's coming down from the Republican caucus and from Mr. Ryan? I want to take up another subject and uh, cover it briefly, or maybe not so briefly. And this has to do with the subject matter at hand, which is the deficit. We need to understand where the deficit came from. The deficit didn't just get created in the last couple of years. Uh, certainly the Great Recession had a lot to do with it. The stimulus package made up of two parts. One part was the, uh, the bank bailout, $700 million or more. 
almost all of that has now been repaid to the Treasury, so you don't have to worry about that being a big part of the deficit. A little bit remains, but most of it has been repaid. The second part was the stimulus, some $750 million. That was borrowed money. That is part of the deficit. But that also created or maintained well over 2 million jobs here in the United States. Those people that stayed at work were continuing to be employed and to pay taxes. You can imagine what would have happened had the stimulus not been there, but nonetheless, it is part of the deficit. But that doesn't account for all of the deficit. Let's go back to where uh, Ronald Reagan was president. At the end of each year, the Congressional Budget Office takes a look at the status of the budget of the United States and says, here's what's happening today, and here's the projection for the future. They do a 10-year projection. At the end of Ronald Reagan's term, the Congressional Budget Office, nonpartisan, not Democrat, not Republican, looked at the budget, looked at the economy and said, well, the way things are, we can project for the next 10 years that the budget will have a deficit of $1.3 trillion. So Ronald Reagan left office with a deficit. He was followed by George W. Bush. And the same projection was made every year, and every year the deficit grew so that at the end of the George W. Bush administration, before Bill Clinton took office, there was a projected additional deficit of about $3 billion additional dollars, $3 trillion additional dollars. Bill Clinton came into office, changes were made, the Balanced Budget Act went into effect, PAYGO, which required laws to be paid for with new taxes or with cuts, no more deficit financing for new laws, came into effect, and at the end of the Clinton administration, the normal process took place at the end of that year, what will be the deficit going forward? Whoa! You mean there is no deficit? Yes, the Congressional Budget Office estimated at the end of the Clinton period that there would be a $5 trillion surplus, literally paying off the entire debt of the United States. Policies were put in place during that presidency, Democrat-Republican votes on both sides, that would, in the 10 years, 2001 to 2010, terminate the American debt. However, in 2001, George W. Bush and the Republicans in control of the Congress and the Senate passed a massive tax cut that immediately turned that projected surplus into a projected deficit of well over a trillion dollars. The next year, the Afghan war was underway and the Iraq war was begun. Two wars, first time ever in American's history that a, that a war was underway for which there was no way to pay for it except to borrow money. In previous wars, World War II, World War I, the Civil War, the government raised taxes to pay for the war, but not these two wars. This was entirely borrowed, all of the cost of it. And right now, the Afghanistan war is costing 100 to 120 billion dollars a year and we just voted today not more than an hour and a half ago for 157 billion dollars for the Afghanistan and Libya and Iraq wars 157 billion dollars now again all on borrowed money despite efforts by the democratic caucus to raise money raise taxes to pay for those wars, taxes on the highest, most wealthiest Americans, those votes failed. Now, the rest of the story is this. My friend, Mr. DeFazio, talked about the Medicare drug donut hole. The Medicare drug donut hole was added during the Bush administration, well over $600 million a year, again, not paid for, but rather borrowed money. And then the Great Recession of 2008 and 9. That Great Recession added to the deficit because employment plummeted along with tax revenues. So that at the end of the George W. Bush administration, 
This Congressional Budget Office did what it had done every year in the past 50 years, did a projection in the next 10 years, what will be the deficit? Guess what the number was? 11 trillion plus dollars. And so we, during the 2001-2010 period, an enormous growth in the American deficit. Barack Obama came into office on January, in January of 2009, and the day he took office, he had an annual budget deficit handed to him of over $1,300,000,000. The George W. Bush legacy was handed directly to Barack Obama the day he took office, over a trillion dollars. We have to work ourselves out of this hole. This is a deep, dangerous hole, and we've got to work our way out of it. And we have to do it with wisdom. We have to do it with intelligence. And we have to always keep in mind where we need to go. Two paths. One, bring the deficit down. And two, provide those services that are desperately needed by Americans. Medicare, Medicaid, education, services that provide people the opportunity to get jobs. Those are fundamental investments that we must make, research and the like also included. Simultaneously, we must always achieve efficiency and effectiveness in every governmental program, wherever it happens to be. And we know that the medical systems in the United States are inefficient. So the proposal put forth by our Republican colleagues to privatize, destroy Medicare, does nothing to deal with the inefficiencies of the medical system. There are three parts to the medical system. The, the collection of money, the payment of claims, and the provision of services. Medicare happens to be the most efficient delivery in the collection of money, the payment of claims, and the delivery of services of any of the medical services and medical systems out there. The private insurance companies, however, are the least efficient, the least efficient, creating, because of the plethora, the numerous policies that, that they offer, confusion to the purchaser of the policy, whether it's an individual or, govern, or, or business, and to the provider of services. Go into any hospital, and one of the biggest sections in the hospital is not the emergency room, not the operating room, not the intensive care unit. It is the administrative unit. Why? Because they have to deal with thousands of different policies, different deductibles, different co-pays, different policies from different companies. Is this going to be paid? Who's going to pay that? And so forth. Creating the least efficient medical delivery system in the world. A full 30% of all of the medical costs are in administration. Keep in mind that the Medicare, on the other hand, is the most efficient, spending no more than 3% in collecting the money and paying the bills. So, the proposal that we have before us by the Republicans to terminate Medicare and hand it over to the insurance company will create even additional costs, more inefficiency in the system, less effectiveness. That's not the way to go. We talked earlier about the drug donut hole for Medicare seniors. Why was it that the Republicans refused to allow the federal government to negotiate prices with the insurance, with the pharmaceutical companies. It is the most ineffective, inefficient, stupid thing in the world to spend tens and hundreds of billions of dollars a year on drugs and not be able to negotiate, but simply to be a price taker. Not a negotiator. Not to use your purchasing power to negotiate. I don't understand. Well, I do understand. I know exactly what it is. It happens to do with the effective lobbying and contributions of the pharmaceutical industry. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We can and we must go to the medical system and seek efficiencies. And it can be done. I've spent a lot of my time in, as insurance commissioner looking at how it can be done. 
and we'll go into that at, an, at another time. But I'll give you a couple of items along the way. A doctor goes in to a hospital and scribbles on a piece of paper the, uh, what he believes to be wrong with the person. Writes on a piece of paper in illegible language, uh, handwriting what the pharmaceutical will be. Medical errors abound. We know that infections occur in hospitals. We know that readmissions occur in hospitals. All of those things need not exist in America. We can significantly reduce the cost of medical services by instituting uh, electronic medical records. That can be done. And in fact, in the health care reform bill, the Affordable Care Act, it is done. Republicans want to repeal that. Somehow they think that's going to reduce cost. I don't think so. But nonetheless, that's what they want to do. There are many other things that can be done. Infections rate, readmissions. We need to be a front of Ill, in front of illnesses. We need to have public health services. But yet in the CR, the continuing resolution that passed this House, just this day, not more than two hours ago, the clinics in America are reduced and people will wind up in the emergency rooms. We know that's the most expensive place in this nation to get medical care. Yet we get this kind of CR that comes through here, this continuing resolution to fund the government that reduces clinics all across this nation. Well, I think I need a glass of water, and I notice that my colleague from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, has arrived to join us in this moment. Thank you for coming here. I'm going to get a drink of water, and you're going to carry on. Well, I thank my friend from California. I hope you don't go too far for that water, because I want to uh, uh, kind of express my concern about the way the, the Republican Party, the majority in the House, is uh, uh, providing for running this country. It's... Uh, it's a pretty frightening uh, set of circumstances that we have when this country is run on a week-to-week -week basis. The, the funding for our troops, the funding for our transportation, the funding for Medicare, for Social Security, for health care of all kinds is on a week-to-week -week basis. It's very difficult for a family to operate on a week-to-week -week basis. It's, nearly impossible for a business to operate on a week-to-week -week basis. But apparently for my friends on the Republican side, it's okay for a nation to run on a week-to-week -week basis. So today, uh, in, in what they, I think, believe was a great accomplishment, provide for another week of funding so that uh, the various parts of our government, whether it's education, transportation, homeland security, the military, veterans affairs, all those kinds of things are just operating on a one-week basis. That is no way to run a railroad or a country. We've got to do much better than this. And there's no question that we have budgetary issues that this nation has to confront. But my friends on the Republican side of the aisle They'd like to take it all out, deal with the whole budget, but only in a very slim part. In effect, punish a very tiny part of the budget for the ills that I would say occurred under the Bush administration. Big tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires, prosecute a couple wars without paying for them, and then allow Wall Street to run amok without any police. That's what caused the debt. Energy efficiency didn't cause the debt in America. Preschool programs didn't cause the debt in America. You know, the National Institute of Health didn't cause this debt in America that we really do have to deal with today. There's no question about it. But those are the people, those are the things that they'd like to blame for the debt. It's across the board. And there's got to be a shared sacrifice. Both millionaires and billionaires have to you know, put up as part of their approach to all this. There's got to be a revenue component to this as well as an expense. And so I say to my friend from California, this one-week approach to uh, managing something as big as America is crazy. And 
It's got to stop. We need to have a real budget, real appropriations, so that people that do business with the government can have solid expectations uh, for their contracts. People that work in the government know that they're going to get paid. People that receive benefits in one fashion or another know that next week things will keep going. Because this country is great and it is strong and it will be here a long time after any of us. But this month-to-month, -month, day to day week-to-week -week approach to management is just bad news for America, and I hope it changes very soon. So I'd, I'd return the mic to my friend uh, from California. Uh, if I might, Mr. Perlmutter, you, you've talked about several issues. Let me just put some <laughs> numbers on those issues, because they're really important. Two hours ago, the Republicans in this House passed, without Democratic support, a continuing resolution for a, for a while. And there were cuts in those. We don't talk about the, for the most part, there was no debate here on the floor about the specific cuts. But you raised these issues. I'm going to put some numbers to what you talked about. Do we know the Women, Infant, and Children's Program, the WIC program? These are for mothers, pregnant mothers at risk during their pregnancy and then after their pregnancy so they have adequate nutrition and health care so they have a healthy baby. Saving us money. If that baby's not healthy, this is going to cost a lot of money. The Women's Infant and Children, the WIC program, $200 million reduction in it. Um, we like to deal with, we like to fight crime, right? $149 million out of the construction account so that there can be police stations and other facilities for the police across the state. Um, you, you mentioned uh, environmental issues. $192 million from the Department of Energy's environmental cleanup. What are they cleaning up? They're cleaning up the nuclear waste material from the previous Cold War nuclear programs. We know a lot all of a sudden about nuclear contamination. Oh, good. We're going to take $192 million out and just leave that uh, nuclear waste out there to do what it's going to do, and it won't be good. Uh, and also there's another, uh, you mentioned the banking industry. We know that between 2001 and 2008, the Bush administration and the Federal Reserve just said, they'll regulate themselves. We don't need to police the banking. And so we wound up with the great crash. Well, we passed the uh, Wall Street reform. We put in serious policing. We're going to police those Wall Street reform. We put in serious Policing. We're going to police those characters. We're not going to let them get away with greed is good and rip off the public. We need policemen. But the Republicans don't believe in this. And so they took a total of $590 million out of the financial services programs. These are the policemen that protect America's financial future. We got a call from... Uh, CalPERS and CalSTRS, the two big California pension agencies who came to Congress and said, do not do this. Wall Street needs to be policed. Don't cut the police. I'm going to go a couple of more. Um, let's see. Uh, how about clean water and drinking water? $700 million out of the clean water fund. This is communities to build water systems so there's clean water. You go through this and you say, what are they thinking? What do they think? You mentioned... Okay, your turn. Well, continue on. And I'd say to my friend, look, I wish we were not here. I wish that going back to 2001, 2002, President Bush hadn't had the country take a voluntary pay cut. We were on a road to a surplus. We were almost done getting rid of the debt. But no, you know... We're just the opposite right now because we took a voluntary pay cut to this country. Then we prosecute two big wars to the tune of a trillion dollars and under the Bush administration had those wars on a whole set of different books. Didn't really account for it as part of the debt of this country. Well now, under President Obama, we have real accounting so we know how bad the books look. And then we had this crash on Wall Street. Now, those things all add up to a lot of debt. There's no doubt about it. And when the country hit the crash, the income to the country dropped and the expenses went up. Now, I mean, I don't think we should ever forget how we got here, but we're here and we've got to deal with this. So I respect 
people who want to confront this. But the values and the priorities that are being expressed by the Republican Party in how to deal with this are just so misplaced. You know, they want to maintain the tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires. They want to maintain tax cuts that encourage people to send jobs overseas. And they want to maintain tax cuts for oil companies when we're at 105 or 6 bucks a barrel, for goodness sakes. You don't need to, much encouragement to start drilling at that high a price. So, you know, those kinds of things have to be looked at very closely when all of a sudden you're taking it out of, the, you know, a number of those programs and people that you talked about. Early childhood, health care, education, transportation. We're going to have to share this sacrifice, no question about it. And as Democrats, we're prepared to do that. It isn't going to be fun. It isn't a lot of um, excitement when you really have to manage those expenses, but you also have to have the revenue to, to deal with the, the budget that we have in front of us. My, my friends on the Republican side of the aisle would like to say, well, you know what? Nobody really has to pay for these tax cuts. Nobody really has to pay for uh, sending jobs overseas. They're wrong. They're just flat wrong. We've got to change this. And I wish, you know, they're in the majority. They're running the show here in the House. You know, this one week at a time, that's a joke. Nobody can really manage. And people doing business with the government, with the country, and they need to have some firm uh, confidence in what's going on. My friends on the Republican side of the aisle just keep undermining the confidence of people doing business in this country. So we've got a lot of work to do. It really is going to take both sides of the aisle. You know, I appreciate the president rolling up his sleeves, trying to get this done, the Senate working on it. But there are some on the other side of the aisle that don't understand what the word compromise means to get to a greater goal, which is to get this budget under control. And I yield back to my friend from California. Thank you. You've raised a couple of issues. I'd like to carry them a little further. You raised the tax issue. In the proposed budget, not the CR today that, that uh, funded the government for another week, but rather in the proposal for the next year and beyond, the Republicans propose to continue the Bush era, ta era tax cuts of 2001 for the super wealthy in America. Now that's about $700 billion added to the deficit. Not only that, that tax rate is 35%. They are proposing to lower that tax rate to 25%. So for the super wealthy in America, we're talking about millionaires, people that annual income is a million dollars, and people whose annual income is a billion dollars, to give them a lower tax rate. Are we talking shared sacrifice here? I think not. I want to just turn to this chart, which was handed to me by one of our colleagues, uh, who's actually on the, uh, uh, the President's Deficit uh, Commission. Uh, and she said... The, the facts are pretty clear. Not pretty clear, they're crystal clear. She said that between 1974 and 2009, there's been a shift in the wealth and the income of Americans. And what's happened is that the rich have gotten really rich and everybody else has been treading water, not really going anywhere. So if you take a look at this, you'll see that over that 20-year period, for those at the very bottom, they've seen their income go up by $200 a year. And as you move on up, as you get to the top uh, 60, uh, excuse me, those in the 80 percent, uh, percentile, they've seen better. They've got about $100,000. But when you get to the one-tenth of one percent, one-tenth of one percent of the population, their average annual income has gone up by just under six million dollars a year. Five million nine hundred seventy eight thousand eight hundred and seventy dollar annual increase for the top one tenth of one percent. Another chart, I don't have it with me right now, would show that for these people, the top one percent, they now have twenty five percent of all of the wealth of America. Go back. Go back to nineteen seventy four. They had seven percent of the wealth in America. 
74, the top 1%, 7%. 2009, the top 1%, controlled 24% of all the wealth in America. An enormous shift has taken place here. The middle class has been left behind, basically stagnant, basically treading water. Now, understanding that reality of America, the stagnation of the middle class, the struggle for not one family earner, but two, wife and husband, out working, trying to keep the family together, in the home, with the health care, the kids going off to school. That's the struggle of middle America. So what do the Republicans propose? Their proposal will shift the tax burden away from the super rich to the middle class because they want to reduce the taxes on the super rich from 35 percent to 25 percent and inevitably that's going to raise the taxes for the middle class to make up the difference. We will not let that happen. I notice that my colleague from the great Midwest has joined us and thank you very much. I suspect you may have something to say about that.